Wow. So at this point, I'm basically just thinning it down. Things will come around if we take this top of it. My name is Kirsten Recknitz, and I am a senior instructor for the Boulder Outdoor Survival School, also known as BOSS. BOSS is about outdoor survival, uh, more so about outdoor thrival. So in the next couple of days, we are going to cover traditional living skills, including bow drill and hand drill friction fires, uh, primitive shelters, debris shelters, A-frame poncho shelters. We'll also be going over knives, stone knives, doing a little bit of flint napping, um, some woodworking, maybe make a spoon. I'd like to make an atlatl and a dart with you if we have the opportunity as well, do some fletching, and just kind of feel out what it's like to be outside 24-7 and try to remove modern gear and replace it with things and resources that we have that are straight off of the land right here. At BOSS we have an order of operations for what we should do in a survival scenario. We believe that in any survival scenario, the first and most important thing you need is mental composure to be uh, imagined by this rock here. If you are unable to stay grounded, if you're unable to have a positive attitude about the potential future of being successful in this survival situation, you are much more likely to fail. So being composed, admitting that your situation is real and that you have to act and stopping for a moment. Stopping, thinking, observing, and making a plan just in the first few seconds that you realize you're in a dire situation, this is the most important piece of the priorities of survival, mental composure. Once your mental composure, your groundedness is handled, the next step we move to are critical medical emergencies. Uh, to be represented by a pack of hydrocortisone cream and a roll of med tape in this case. But really, these are the type of emergencies related to airway, breathing, and circulation. Uh, not having enough oxygen circulating or having a blockage where you're unable to breathe, people can die within minutes. So taking care of those critical emergencies within a few minutes of a survival situation is what needs to happen next. After three minutes, we get into around three hours. Three hours is the core body temperature. Thermoregulation is critical to your survival. If you get too hot or you get too cold, you can pass within hours. So for example, if we were too cold, I might have a bow drill fire set with me to take care of heating or warming myself, perhaps an emergency blanket to either keep me warm or potentially protect me from the sun if I'm unable to find shade or a cold water source to get into. Once your first three priorities of survival are taken care of, the next thing that we need to concentrate on is hydration. Uh, people have died within a day and lasted up to five days without having water, but on average about three days is your maximum before you can die from dehydration. So I am bound uh, to take either a purification system or droplets with me um, and a steel or metal water bottle in order to boil and purify water. It may be surprising to hear, but actually humans can last at least a few weeks without any food. So food certainly comes way down the list of priorities. Um, however, it is going to be important for you to keep your mental composure, to not get lightheaded, to not be hangry, hungry and angry, um, and to have the energy you need to continue taking care of your main priorities. So I may carry with me a Paiute deadfall trap and perhaps uh, a quick small snare just in my emergency kit to have those things covered. After three weeks we get into three seasons. Humans are a social species and to not have any connection can lead us all the way back to our beginning, that mental composure. We can be broken and start making mistakes, forgetting to drink water, forgetting to take care of our core body temperature, even forgetting to eat out of depression perhaps. And you'll need to be able to connect with something, be it an inanimate object, a tree, an animal, or perhaps somebody who's also on this adventure or journey with you. Um, I myself usually carry around a little picture of my nephew. Um, he, when I have been in some bad situation, reminds me of why it's so important that I get back, that I don't give up, and that I stay strong. 
uh, relating to something in the wild is, is critical to being able to hang in there uh, when you're alone. In the United States, most people are known to be lost within 72 hours and rescue scenarios either happen within that period of time or the week or two following. A really important thing to have in your survival kit is some signaling device. I carry with me a signaling mirror, a heliograph. Uh, it's nice to make sure that you get these of great quality versus something that's plastic or can scratch easily. You really want this to be able to blind somebody in a plane, for example. So having that with me is important. So overall now, we are actually looking at what I might say, barring the rock, uh, is what I would take with me in my survival kit. So, overall, while we're able to line out the priorities of survival using rules of three, three minutes, three hours, three days, etc., it is person dependent, and it might be five minutes for someone before they actually die from bleeding out. It may be five days before someone needs water, or it may be one day before they need water, before they die of dehydration. So experience and knowing oneself is going to be huge in all of this, and simply what your body type is and your environment are definitely going to alter these. But knowing the order in which you should do these things prepares you for what would happen in a survival situation you already have information so knowing these rules of three is going to bring you the composure that you need because what's between your ears is the most important survival skill that you have it's going to give you the composure that you need to actually go ahead and take care of yourself for however long it is that you are in this survival situation so I'm going to use my heli bushcraft knife and I'm going to go ahead and create a spoon. Uh, hopefully at some point when you're in the backcountry you're going to need to eat. So just show a, some of the many uses that you can, you can press a smaller knife like this into. So I'm just going to go ahead and get into it here and you guys can kind of observe and see what I like to do with my knife. At Boss and with any bushcraft that you're doing, you're gonna find that you're gonna be doing a lot of woodworking, be it making a fire set for friction fire or whittling traps. There's myriad of different uses that your knife is gonna, is gonna need to be pressed into and woodworking is probably the number one. Uh, it's a material that we're using a lot in the backcountry. So um, I have some very strict kind of uh, criteria that I look for in a good knife and I have this heli knife here as an example because this is basically what I'm looking for in a good um, bushcraft knife. Just starting with the blade, we've got a beautiful, nice single bevel, nice scandy grind here. And as far as wood removal, this is beautiful. So when I start a spoon, I like to start with the handle. So I'll start from the transition of the bowl and I'll start to work my way backwards up the handle. And so you can see I'm starting to create this bowl shape. So you can see I've started to round my bowl portion now to create that bowl shape. And I'm basically just you know changing the angle at which I'm planing to do that. So I can almost cut, especially this is aspen, so it's a softer wood, so I can kind of cut cross grain on it pretty easily. And I can start to create that round shape that you want to get for a spoon. And continue to thin it down. Uh, the handle on this particular knife is really nice. I, I generally, on a lot of my bushcraft knives, I don't have much of a guard here. Um, but it is nice to have something to let you know, especially if you're working in low light or something, that where that, that blade transition starts to keep your you know, hand from sliding if you're doing some more heavy uh, you know, carving or whittling. And the other thing about this knife, this isn't a, a full tang knife. I, I do like a full tang knife whenever I can can get my hands on one, but this has got a nice rat tail tang that comes through the whole length of the handle and you can see where it's peened over on the bottom. So it's still a really, really strong blade. It's gonna, it's gonna be able to hold up to a little bit of pounding and beating with the, with the billet. Right, I think I'm gonna go ahead and switch to just <coughs> some hand whittling here.
So I think this knife is really nice. Another thing I actually like about this particular knife is that the blade is actually fairly wide. There's a lot of actions that I'm doing where I'll actually choke up on my knife and hold it by the blade to do that. This gives me plenty of space to hold on to it without getting my fingers in the way of the blade. So I really kind of like that wide uh, uh, width that, that these uh, heli knives have to them. And you can see I can kind of use that width on the heli knife to kind of choke up on the blade so that I can get some pressure up on the belly and kind of do some very, very light trimming. And it gives me the ability to kind of facilitate a curve here as well where the handle meets the spoon bowl. And got plenty of room to safely hold on to that blade without risking cutting myself. And again, this is, I'm moving down to lighter strokes now. So I'm not really using, basically I'm just turning my wrist. I'm not actually applying a whole lot of pressure. Uh, this knife has an amazingly sharp edge on it. And so it's making quick work of this Aspen. <clears throat> so we've got it whittled out to this point. It's basically just a, a blank, uh, nice and quick and dirty. And one of the more challenging things to do just with a regular bushcraft knife is to get a good bowl carved out in a, in a spoon. Um, when I do them, more permanent, nice spoons, I usually use a crooked knife to, to achieve that. But just out in the field, uh, the quickest and one of my favorite ways to, to make a bowl is to actually coal burn it with a, a coal from the fire. So we're at that point now. I'm going to go ahead and get a coal from the fire here. Okay, so I'll just place it on and then I'm going to hold it down with a twig. and just start introducing oxygen to it. Okay, <clears throat> that's a pretty good start. So basically I just want this wood to start to char. And then at that point, I could just use a stick or here I have a, a piece of basalt just something with a rough edge that I can start to scrape that charred material out. And you can see how deep that went just in that first go. So at this point, I'm gonna go ahead and get another coal. This time, whoop, this time I'm gonna use a little bit larger coal, to start to expand that bowl out toward the edge of my spoon. So that's about perfect there. And you, these coals are lightweight, so it's always good to hold it down with a twig. You don't want to just blow on it and have it blow right back into your fire pit, so. Okay, so after about three or four rounds of adding coals and blowing on it, this is where I'm at. So I've gone through and done a little bit more fine whittling, and I've, I've started to kind of sand more of the char out, you can see there's still some char in there. And you don't have to get all of the char out. You can basically just go until you're satisfied. All right, well this is Matt Furchis again with Boulder Outdoor Survival School and that's how you make a, a quick spoon, quick coal burn spoon in 15 minutes. Please come join us at the Boulder Outdoor Survival School. We teach primitive living skills courses that range in length from 72 hours to seven days, 14 days, and all the way up to 28 days in length. You'll learn skills such as the priorities of survival, friction fire methods, debris shelters, animal processing, and wild food harvesting. All these skills and more will allow you to travel vast distances utilizing Boss's philosophy that if you know more, you can carry less.